you know, at the end of the day, if you don't like where you are, you can move because you're not a trade. But sometimes that takes time and that's fine. But the only thing I have a problem with is, is, is if you're spending the few hours of free time you have every day, not making arrangements to change down the road, but rather bitching about your situation, then I kind of have a problem with it because you have the opportunity to at least start the process. Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces who are working to change the world. This episode is brought to you by Brain FM. Brain FM combines the best of music and neuroscience to help you relax, focus, meditate, and even sleep. I love it and have been using it to write, create, and do some of my deepest work. Because you're a listener of the show, you can get a free trial. Head over to brain.fm slash innovative mindset to check it out. If you decide to subscribe, you can get 20% off with the coupon code innovative mindset, all one word. And now let's get to the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm your host, and I'm super happy you're here. I'm also really happy and honored to have this week's guest. The New York Times has called Peter Shankman a rock star who knows everything about social media and then some. He's a five-time best-selling author, entrepreneur, and corporate keynote speaker, focusing on customer service and the new and emerging customer and neuroatypical economy. With three startup launches and exits under his belt, most notably Help a Reporter Out, Peter is recognized worldwide for radically new ways of thinking about the customer experience, social media, PR, marketing, advertising, and ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and the new neurodiverse and remote economies. In addition to his passion for helping people and companies find success, some of Peter's highlights also include founder of Harrow, Help a Reporter Out, which became the standard for thousands of journalists looking for sources prior to being acquired three years after launch, futurist in residence at Epic Marketing Consultants, focusing on the customer experience of tomorrow, Faster Than Normal, the Internet's number one podcast on ADHD, focusing on the superpowers and gifts of having a faster than normal brain, which has helped thousands of people all around the world realize that having a neurodiverse brain is actually a gift, not a curse. The Shank Minds Breakthrough Network, an elite online mastermind of thought leaders, business experts, and change makers. Peter's a worldwide influencer and or spokesperson for several global brands, including Sylvania, National Car Rental, Manscaped.com, Sealface, Thule, and many others. Finally, Peter is a father, a two-time Ironman triathlete, a Class B licensed skydiver, and has a pretty serious Peloton addiction. When he's not traveling around the world speaking to companies big and small, he's based in New York City with a 7-year-old daughter and 20-year-old cat, and dog, all of whom consistently refuse him access to the couch. Peter, I'm super thrilled that you're here. Welcome. Hey, great to be here. Thanks. First of all, I'm a big, huge fan. I've read Faster Than Normal before, and I just got a copy from my husband because the audiobook is out and because he's not a big reader. He has ADHD, and he's plowing through it and loving it. And he now, of course, from the movie Up, keeps going, squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah at all sorts of times but anyway i, I want to just jump right out in if that's okay with you you it's been said have an incredible imagination and incredible intuition and i'm wondering how does how do those those parts of you relate to adhd if they do and how do you use them to make it your superpower well you know it's interesting i think that you know people can say anything um <laughs> i think that that for me a lot of it is when you have a faster brain, you have a couple of options. You can try to slow down to match everyone else, or you can accept that that's really, really hard to do. And you can sort of learn to to speak uh, slower than you think. So what do I mean by that? Um, I will sit there and come up with 15 ideas in five minutes because it's fun. Um, 13 of them might be beneficial, two of them might be terrible, whatever. But I will spend time to sort of understand uh, what's going on and then present the top couple of ideas of the world. The difference is, is that I've accepted that no matter how calmly I do that, there are be people who think the idea is crazy. And so the goal is to learn not to care about what people think and never let that prevent you 
from doing something fun or doing something that you want to do or creating something or starting something new or whatever. Okay, so within that, people might think it's crazy, but you come up with the idea, and I'm wondering, are you in that moment trying to solve a problem that you've seen, or is it just the ideas come rapid fire, and how do you reconcile the two? If, for example, you come up with an idea that someone else might think is crazy, but... It's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. Um, you know, it, it's it's sort of stealing yourself for the fact that that when you present the idea, there's going to be at least one person who says, what the hell is wrong? You know, but <laughs> okay. on the, on, but then understanding that, that 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 the situations and the ideas that you present in the past have actually benefited. You know, I have a little bit of a positive track record in that. And I've had several ideas in the past that have actually turned into, you know, great companies or, you know, uh, million to multi-million dollar exits, things like that. So that gives you a little bit of credibility. Um, the, the key, though, is to keep moving forward. The thing about ADHD is that is that forward motion, um, whether, you're, whether you have ADHD or you're an entrepreneur, forward motion is thrilling. And if you're not going forward, even if you're just standing still, it kind of feels like you're going backwards and that's a problem. So for me, it's always about forward motion. If I have an idea and it doesn't work, I try another one, right? That doesn't work, I try another one. There are gonna be ideas that'll work. It happens all the time. So the key is to keep moving forward no matter what. Okay. And yet there are times when ADHD is something that allows you to think laterally, to look at things from a different angle. How does that align with the forward motion that you're talking about? There's several ways. I mean, I mean, the, the, the premise of, um, you know, just this morning I was on a, a call with a client and, and, and the client was going back and forth about an idea that they just, they didn't see it working, they didn't see it working. And rather than try to sort of convince them it would, I said, well, what if we take it, what if we go 45 degrees to the left and look at it this way? And all of a sudden, oh, okay, well, maybe that, you know, it, it's, it's all the stuff that I got in trouble for in school, right? Speaking out of turn, uh, 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 you know, cracking jokes, uh, disrupting the class because I, I talking about something I completely come up with something completely different type thing all that um has sort of given allowed me to to to, to use that to my benefit as a as a you know as an adult um uh, the key is to be in an industry to be in a place to be in a world where where creativity is lauded is not uh pushed down and 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 and, and thrown away um you know I know that some ideas I'm gonna, I'm gonna put down to be like no that's we're not gonna do that and that's not gonna happen um, and sort of once you uh, realize there are going to be people like that and you just move on, you find your people, you find the people who, who, who um, appreciate what you can bring to the table. Um, I heard a great quote once, because uh, there have been times when I've had to let people leave my table because we just didn't, you know, they couldn't understand my speed. I couldn't understand their non-speed. Um, and I heard a great quote, I, just because we're no longer friends doesn't mean I wish you ill. I, I don't want you to starve. I just don't want you to eat at my table. Right. And if you are creative and your, and your brain does work differently, occasionally you have to realize that not everyone's going to think like you. And if you spend your entire life focused on the fact that, that things you do are not always going to be understood or are not always going to be accepted or, you know, you're not, you're going to be asked, why aren't you normal? Things like that. If you spend your entire life being upset about the fact that's happening, you're never going to be able to grow. Um, I think Winston Churchill said, you'll, you'll never reach your destination if you stop to yell at every dog that barks. Right? So sometimes you just have to make it on your own and, 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 and move forward and understand that, yeah, here we go. Um, and it's, it's, I've found great success in that. It took a long time and a lot of, um, a lot of uh, therapy, but in the end, I realized that, you know, the ideas that I've had, some of them have been very beneficial. Some of them have been great. Some of them failed, but I will never stop um, continuing to do that. Yeah, nor should you. I mean, there, there are certain ideas. Certainly Harrow is one of those that I love. Help reporter out. I've used it myself and continue to use it. And that, that begs the question that you've had all these successful companies. Some of them have been multi-million dollar deals. And then you're moving forward when you're doing that. And there are times, okay, well, I've been lurking on your blog and you talk God, yes. about feeling like an imposter. God, okay, yes. so what was that? How, how does that work? Is that, is that the ADHD brain? Is that your personality? And if so, which would, whichever one it is, how are you making those work for you? It's a little bit of everything. I think there's a part of it that, you know, no matter how 
I could give a speech to 30,000 people and get a 30,000 person standing ovation. If one person doesn't stand up, that's the person I'm gonna focus on. Oh my God, mm. everyone hated it. It was terrible. Let alone the fact that, that, that my eyes are literally telling me that 29,999 people liked it, right? There's right. always been that one. And, and, and again, that's something you have to work on constantly because a lot of times, you know, growing up with ADHD, growing up with sit down, you're disrupting the class disease and growing up with you're wrong and you're weird and why you're so stupid and why you're so strange. You know, no matter how much success you have, that tends to stick in your brain and that tends to pop up at the most inconvenient times. Um, it's taken years to get over that, but every little bit of success I have, everything that I do that tends to benefit, you know, from that, I tend to, uh, to learn a little bit more and chip away a little bit more at what I call junior high school Peter, uh, the guy who, who, who took all that shit seriously. Um, you know, the, the perfect example, we we're talking about the triathlon I ran uh, this, this Sunday, my friend, uh, my coach and my friend was at the finish line. He grabbed this photo of me coming across. And my first thought was, oh my God, I am disgusting. I'm sweaty. I'm gross. I still have 25 pounds to lose. I don't look like a triathlon, a triathlete. I look like some fat guy who just got... And then I, I had this moment where I saw the finish line sign behind me and realized, you know, maybe you just look like a guy who just did this race and that's a shit ton more than most people did today. And why don't you own that, right? And it was this wonderful feeling of release and feeling of, 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 of freedom that, yeah, I did just do this. And I can, I can um, appreciate myself for what I just did. And it, it's, it's hard to get there because, you know, you sit there a lot of times with your, with your, with your, your, your ADHD and, you know, your, your concept that, that uh, today is the day when I wake up today is absolutely the day the New York Times is going to have written a huge article about, um, about what a fraud I am and everything I've done has just been luck. And then when they don't, it's obviously because I'm not important enough to be mm. written up by the New York Times, you know, so there's this constant battle with yourself, but, but, you know, you do what you can do and, and, and you, every day you chip a little bit more away at it. And yeah. It's so fascinating that you say that because again, my husband has ADD and he and I talk about this a lot about the notion that no matter, no matter what he does, he doesn't think it's good enough. No matter how, he's an artist and a clown and he always comes back with stories of not thinking that he did well, no matter how well he did. It just wasn't good enough. And on some level it might lead him to strive, but there are times when he just gets down on himself and it's very hard for him to motivate himself and it's impossible for me to motivate him. So do you get to those places where you actually just stop and go, you know what, I just can't today? Or are you always going, no, this is it, right? I get there all the time. And, you know, I have ways to make sure that I am, um, uh, that I don't let that affect me. Um, you know, let it affect me as, as little as possible, but that way I, uh, I, I exercise is massive, right? I have to exercise. I have to work out. I have to get that brain chemistry going in my brain every single day. Um, I was up at 4 a.m. this morning. I was on the bike for an hour. It just it, it gives me the the chemistry I need to to uh, quiet those demons, right? For lack of a better word, and um, it's certainly not easy to do. But you know, if I don't exercise, my day just goes to hell. And so the key is to find a way to build that into everything I need in my day. Um, you know, it's not, it sounds easy, but you know, when you've had, a, when you've worked later or you've had a late dinner or whatever, and you, you know, you get to bed at midnight and it's 4 a.m. and you have to wake up and work out, it's, it's difficult. But I know what will happen if I don't do it. And I certainly don't want that. So, you know, I, it's, I've heard it, it's called playing the tape forward. Um, alcoholics talk about it a lot. Uh, the premise that, um, you know, okay, I'm going to have this one drink. Well, if I have this one drink, where am I going to be in 12 hours? And it never ends well when you think about it that way. So the key is to not think about it that way. The key is to not have that first drink. Um, for me, it's sort of the same thing. If I don't exercise, it'll be 6 p.m. or 4 p.m. and 12 hours will have passed either way. But what kind of a day am I? Right. Will it be a better day or a worse day? And so that is usually enough to get me up. And again, that's enough to get me up, but not all the time. I'm not perfect. You know, I will sleep in every once in a while ago. You know, I'll sleep <laughs> in and I will, I will, I will skip a workout and I'll pay for it. Um, the key is not to not to get into such a rut where you are where you are where that one miss um, becomes a two, three, four, five, six week cycle. Um, that's you. You know, you don't want to uh, uh, so it's one of the reasons I, I rarely drink anymore is because I would I would I would 
you know, I wasn't going out to get drunk, but I, I, oh, I'm going to a client event. Oh, the alcohol is free. Great. I'll have four drinks. I'll have five drinks. I wasn't getting drunk, but I wasn't, you know, I'd come home a little hungover, not hungover, but you know, I'd be a little dehydrated. I wouldn't wake up the next morning and work out. Well, I'm not a, okay. I might as well, um, you know, I blew, I blew the workout this morning. I might as well get a bacon, egg and cheese to sop up the grease or two of them. Well, I blew my breakfast. So I fuck it. Let's just get dinner. I'll have a pizza. I'll start tomorrow. All of a sudden it's two weeks later. Mm-hmm. Right. I've gained eight pounds and, and I'm sitting there. What the hell just happened? So, you know, it's a great line from the movie War Games when the computer realizes uh, uh, how to avoid I love war. That line. It's the only winning move is not to play. And <laughs> yes, for me, uh, very often, the only winning move is not to play. I have um, uh, I heard another great quote, read something like um, uh, the demons in my subconscious are too hard to beat. Therefore, I simply must not battle them. Oh, both of those quotes are fantastic. Yeah, I love it. I love it. First time I saw War Games and heard Whopper say that, you know, oh, yeah. interesting game. The only winning like move is not to play. What What was that? a nice game of chess. Yes, yes, exactly. My favorite. Here's the thing, though. There are times when we're in situations where, you know, there are people with ADHD who are in jobs that they hate or are doing the nine to five when, when they're not suited for it. Uh, because right. maybe they're neuroatypical. How? What? What is your guidance for someone who is who perhaps hasn't gotten to the point where they want to be an entrepreneur, or whether they want to start their own business, or whether they can be on their own? What do you tell someone who's in that nine to five who might hate it, is not well suited for it because of some of the neuroatypical situations in their lives? I think the first thing to understand is that I'm. I would never judge anyone on on, on what kind of job they're doing or, or how they're living their life. What matters is are they happy? And if they're not, do they have the ability to change that? Um, you know, there are people, I, I, you have these, you have these sort of entrepreneur gurus that can't stand, you know, if you're not happy, if you hate your job, you should quit, go out on your own, you know, and if you have to work 22 hours a day, so be it. Okay, you just told someone to, you know, give them someone the recipe to kill themselves. That's, that's not recommended, right? right. So I'm not going to say, oh, you're a miserable new dog, quit. We don't all have that opportunity, right? And, and it's, it's, it's really privileged of us to think that everyone can do that. So, I don't think sure. that way. What I do, however, think is that if you understand that you are not happy where you are, you have to start making the correct um, arrangements so that at some point down the road, you can quit um, so that you can change your life. So that you, do, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't like where you are, you can move because you're not a trade. But sometimes that takes time and that's fine. But the only thing I have a problem with is, is, is if you're spending the few hours of free time you have every day, not making arrangements to change down the road, but rather bitching about your situation, then I kind of have a problem with it because you have the opportunity to at least start the process, right? So if you're miserable, and where you are, look to things and don't just look for a new job because it's better than your old job. Look for something that will truly make you happy and then work backwards and figure out how to get there. Again, it's not easy. I don't expect you to do it tomorrow, but it is doable. Um, I didn't become an entrepreneur until I realized I could. I didn't think that's what you did. Both my parents were teachers. I, I didn't know anyone was an entrepreneur. I figured you worked for someone else. You worked 40 years, got a gold watch, and retired. Um, I got laid off from America Online and my first job out of college and uh, sitting in the parking lot going, what the hell just happened? And I realized, you know, I'm going to try it. I'm going to go out on my own. I know how to do PR. I learned from AOL. I'm going to try it. What the, what's the worst that can happen? When it, I literally said, when it fails, I'll get a job. Not if it fails. When it fails, I'll get a job. <laughs> it's been 98 to almost 08, 18, and almost 24 years later, and I haven't had a good job. So I've been incredibly lucky. Um, that being said, there have been incredible highs and incredible lows. Um, but if, yeah, if you're miserable where you are, figure out what you can do and how you can improve your current situation to get to where you want to be at some point. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do rapid fire because I know we don't have that much time. I would love to know from you, you talk about in Faster Than Normal, your fabulous book, you talk about how your body, and I don't know if it's actually all ADHD people, but you say that your body does not produce enough dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline. And I'm wondering Mm -hmm. how those, how does that relate? That's pretty much ADHD. Okay, so how does that how does that relate? What is what does that do for you, and how do you address that issue? So a combination of dopamine, serotonin, and adrenaline allows you to focus. It allows you to sit down and do the things that you don't necessarily love to do. So I'll give you an example. In school, I was the class clown, and I would get in trouble for being the class clown. Why was the class clown? 
Well, in the subjects that I loved, in English, in social studies, I was never the class clown. I paid attention like the greatest student in the world. In math, in science, in things I wasn't good at, I was the class clown. What I realized 30 years later is why I was making jokes and cracking up and, and cracking jokes and cracking wise because when I made a joke and other students laughed, they laughed at something I did, which actually gave me a dopamine hit. And all hmm. of a sudden, I could focus. Of course, I was getting in trouble for it. But I was actually, if you look at it, the big picture, I was getting in trouble because I wanted to learn. Now, I've since learned better ways to get my dopamine, get my adrenaline, get my <laughs> serotonin, so I don't interrupt meetings and you know with bad jokes. But the logic is sound, right? It, it is the same thing. Um, you know, we all know every single one of us. There's not a person in the world who understand who doesn't understand that texting while driving is dangerous and will kill you. Here's hoping. But so many people still do it. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Because every time we hear a text, every time we see a message, every time we get a, a tweet or reply or whatever, our brain actually releases dopamine. It's an addiction. So it's yeah. no different if dopamine gives us that focus chemical and that ability to be happy, and ability, then yeah, obviously you're going to want it and you're going to look for it. So the key for kids today in school, we now understand how to find a better way to get it. Um, I've spoken to schools where they've installed uh, something called bouncy bands. They're these little bands that sit on the on the legs of the chair and the kids can bounce their legs on them without making any noise. And just that gives them some adrenaline. Uh, kids are allowed to get up, go to the back of the room, right? Hang out and uh, and just, you know, work standing up, whatever. Little things, uh, more recess, less carbs at, at, at lunch, things like that. You know what's interesting about what you just said? It brings up education in my mind, the whole education system. If I were queen, I would redo it because sitting kids who have such incredible amounts of energy down for so many hours a day, I think is a mistake. I worked at NASA as an educator for many years and I watched it happen. I watched kids be bored and they weren't, it wasn't necessarily that they were ADHD. I don't know what their diagnosis was, if they even had one. And I know that you don't like that word, what their state was. But at the same time, I think so many children have trouble with that. And so if you if you were king and I were queen, what would we do? How would we address kids today and the education system to help them learn better in ways that work for them, whether or not they're neuroatypical? Well, you have to, I mean, it's tough because, you know, you, one teacher, 30 kids, you can't make 30 different ways of learning. But what you can do is you can level the playing field in your in your favor right so you can create um you can create um situations where kids don't come in as entirely uh high energy right so the premise of in, the kid wakes up instead of the kid waking up eating two bowls of chocolate frosted sugar bombs and sitting in front of the television for 45 minutes <laughs> for school wake up have a couple of hard-boiled eggs have some protein walk to school, run around for 45 minutes, go to the schoolyard, you know, have a zero period class that's recess, let the kids work out, exercise first, then bring them into school. They did a study in Texas with a school district in Texas where they did exactly that. They, they gave them 90 minutes of recess a day as opposed to 20. And they upped, uh, they, they changed the carb, uh, they dropped carbs in breakfast and lunch by 70% and up protein by 50 or something like that. And um, they saw a 29% decrease in ADHD outbursts in boys and a 29, a 24% increase in girls getting involved in the class discussion. Those are huge numbers. They really are. Right. So it's those little tiny things that you can do that really do make a huge change. Fascinating. I didn't know about that study. I'm going to have yeah. to go look it up and I'm going to swing it right back to you and ask you about something you said in your book. Again, you said that skydiving, which you're a master skydiver, which I think is great, it gives you a productivity high. And I would love to hear from you, what is it about a dive? I've been skydiving once. I loved it and I want to do it again. But what is it about it that is your rush? What is the productivity high? Well, the dopamine, you're basically jumping into a plane. You're doing something every single molecule your brain says, dumbass, you don't need to do this. The plane can land. Um, and you're literally fighting against that. So the second you enter the atmosphere, the second you jump out of the plane, you're in, you're in air, you're in free fall, your body you have two choices at that point. I can open my parachute and live, or I can not open my parachute and die. That's it. There are no other options. It is the most free you'll ever get. And when that parachute opens and you've quote unquote defied death, I hate that term, but when you've, when, when the parachute opens and you've slowed down and the world comes back into focus and, you know, your hearing comes back and it's no longer the, just the wind and, you know, you, you, 
you have this feeling of euphoria and that is all the dopamine, serotonin and adrenaline firing at once. And so I, and that just doesn't go away. That needs to dissipate over time. So I will drop my parachute. I will, I will land, I'll pull my parachute, uh, full, you know, uh, uh, gather it up, throw it in the corner of the, of the, of the, of the hangar, pull out my laptop, uh, lean on the parachute and then, you know, write 10, 20,000 words in an hour, right? Because I'm so high with, I've double, triple, quadruple the amount of those chemicals in my brain that focus is like, the easiest thing in the world. And I'll do it and I'll get it done. And, and it's interesting because I had a, I was dating a woman once years ago, like 20 years ago, who was a PhD uh, candidate or double PhD, something I should way too smart for me. We should not have been dating. And, and one of the things she was doing was like, she got paid the government, she got government grants to feed cocaine to rats uh, to learn about addiction and pathways and things like that. And, and um, I'm like, so you get free cocaine. She's like, yeah, let's just table that discussion right now. But the point was, um, she took my blood once and she said, I want to, I want to take your blood and see how you are after a jump. And she goes, yeah, you're, you're, she comes like a week later. She's like, yeah, you're basically a half a molecule off from being a full, a full on cocaine addict. I'm like, I don't do cocaine. She's like, no, it's the same exact chemistry. I'm like, huh? I'm like, so instead of, if I need to focus, I just go to cocaine. She goes, Peter, you're really not listening. But the premise was that, um, I was getting that same high, but the difference was I was getting it naturally when you do cocaine, as I, as she taught me, um, the, the brain fires all those, those receptors at once uh, because it doesn't understand what's going on. Um, when you're skydiving, even though you need f- all those receptors to just keep you alive, the brain is still smart enough to keep some in reserve. It's why after I finished skydiving and finished writing 20,000 words, I can still drive home. I don't know a crash. I don't need to immediately do it again. Right. My body is able to process that, keep some of the dopamine for later, return some of the serotonin, things like that, as opposed to illegal drugs which, or, you know, drugs, period, which, which don't do that. They just, oh, send it all. OK, now you're empty. Right. It's the equivalent of, of, of being in a helicopter and having 10, 10 minutes of reserve fuel in case of an, in times of war. So, you know, your body is very smart that way. And if you can figure out how to adapt it um, for me, it's skydiving or running or exercising or public speaking. You know, my, my assistant. Um, knows me so well that that when I do a corporate keynote, she will attempt to get me back in my seat on the airplane home within two hours of my coming off the stage because that's around the time that I that I start to come down from the high, right? And if she times it well and there are no delays, I will sit down that plane and I will fall asleep until we get home. And it's the greatest feeling in the world. It's the deepest sleep I'll ever get. <laughs> it's great to have someone that knows you so well. And and that actually brings me to my next question. Are you one of those people who you're able to start the project and then see it through? Or do you get into what my husband and I call shiny, pretty thing syndrome and go, oh, wait, next thing, squirrel, and then you move on? And if so, what kind of support do you have or need to stay on track? Yeah, it's ADOS, attention deficit, ooh, shiny. Um, what, I have, <laughs> exactly. what I have is a very, very, very powerful calendar. Um, there is not 20 minutes out of my day that is not scheduled. Um, it was brutal during the beginning of COVID because all my keynotes, which went virtual, I had a keynote in Stockholm. Okay, well, I know I'm taking most of my day to fly there. I'm going to sleep. I'm waking up the next morning. I'm speaking. I'm spending the day there. Next morning, I'm flying back home. That's three full days, right? That's 14 hours on a plane and round trip. That is a, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, scheduled time where I can write. Now, that same keynote, that would, the 45 minute keynote that would once take three days, now takes about 45 minutes. So I'll do it at 4 p.m. or at, at you know 7 a.m. or whatever on a. Uh, on a Tuesday out of my apartment and I've done it 745. I've just done all my work for the week and I'm like, okay, well, got a lot of free time. Huh? Oh boy. I could start another company or maybe try meth. You know, it's like you have to, (laughs) yeah. yeah. So, so one of the things I realized right at the beginning of COVID is I have to schedule shit. It doesn't matter if I have nothing to do, I'm going to schedule something to do. So I spent a lot of time. I bought kettlebells. I've gained 16 pounds of muscle in the past 14 months because what the hell else am I going to do? Right. Um, right. But I made sure that my schedule was full and, and, you know, it's, again, it's putting these rules into play. I don't allow myself to uh, ever say, Oh, watch it on Netflix. No, the only time I allow myself to watch Netflix or Hulu is when I'm on the bike, because if I allow myself to do it once, I will watch Netflix and Hulu every day and that's it. I will never get anything done. So I only allow myself to do it when I'm working out because I know I can't do that forever. So it has to be about putting these rules into place. Um, same reason I don't, uh, same reason I don't, uh, you know, that I have, I have two sides of my closet and they're labeled, right? I wake up in the morning, I look, look am, I, am I 
on the road today? Am I speaking somewhere? Am I on TV? No. Okay. T-shirt and jeans. Oh, am I traveling? Am, am I, am I, or am I, am I speaking somewhere? Today? Okay, great. Button down shirt, jacket, and jeans. That's it. My sweaters, my vests, my scarves, all that stuff. It's in my daughter's closet. Um, uh, so I don't have to see it because God forbid I had to look at that stuff. And, oh my God, what should I wear today? I know. I remember that sweater. Oh my God, Laura gave me that sweater. I wonder how she's doing. I should look her up. You know, it's, it's three hours later. And I'm naked in the living room on Facebook. I haven't left the house. <laughs> oh, it sounds like I'm living with you instead of my husband. That's exactly how he does things. And it's interesting because that notion of decision making, what it sounds like you've developed is specific processes to to address the fact that you have sometimes got these issues, either making decisions or getting on to the next thing. Do you detail them somewhere? Are there places where if someone goes, okay, I want to know how Peter Shankman does it, where can someone go if they're interested in finding out more about your process and how you've managed to make ADHD your superpower? So I occasionally offer coaching. I offer high-level coaching. Um, I have a site for that called shankminds.com slash ADHD coaching. I don't love coaching. I don't call myself a coach, but I occasionally help people. Um, I talk about the stuff all the time on uh, at shankman.com. I talk about it on any of my social channels all the time, which is at Peter Shankman on all the channels. Um, I encourage people to email me. Um, you are welcome to, to reach out uh, if you want to go for a run or, or, you know, the only thing I will not do is sit down with you for a meeting, but you want to go for a walk and talk. You want to do an Aaron Sorkin style West Wing meeting and where you walk 25 blocks and, you know, never stop. I'm happy to do that. Um, I, I am always, you know, what I used to do when I go to the airport is if you really want me bad enough, you will take a ride to the airport with me, right? We'll take New, New Jersey Transit from the city to, to the airport and you'll have me for about 40 minutes. Talk about whatever you want, right? And, and you'd be amazed how many people would, would do that. Um, so yeah, for me, it was really about, um, about uh, knowing what works for me, understanding that it might not work for everyone else, but happy, being happy to share what I do at the very least. Ah, I love that. And I'm so grateful that you said that because at some point I'm going to take you up on that. I won't I won't run, but I'll walk. So ah. <laughs> I have just a couple more questions, if that's OK. Sure. I, I wanted to ask you about new ideas. They come to you fast and furious. Where from? What does your brain do differently in that way? And how do you file them? Or do you just remember them? I write them down. I write everything down. Um, when I run, when I exercise, I use my Apple Watch. I make, I make notes. I make memos. Um, this morning on, on, on the Peloton at 4 a.m., I came up with two video ideas. I put them both in. I said, remind me in three hours to try this or write that. You know, as long as it's written down somewhere, I can then transfer. When it's three hours later, when it reminds me, I could transfer it to a, a Google spreadsheet or whatever. And I'm able to, to keep this all when I need to do. Okay, I got to write, got to create something this weekend. When, oh, look, all this stuff I have. Right. So, so I write down everything because, um, you know, some of the greatest lies in the world, um, you know, uh, oh, I'm only five minutes away uh, is right. You know, th those great, great lies, uh, the check is in the mail um, and I'll remember it when I wake up. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I never do. And I keep I do keep a journal right by my bedside so that I can write first thing in the morning. That is so important to me as someone, I, I don't have ADHD or ADD, but I do forget and I get lots of ideas. So I think, I'm so glad that you said that about writing everything down. I think it's such a fantastic way of, of making sure that the things that you think are important actually get down and kept, and kept as important. I'm so grateful. I know this has been fast and furious, and I'm really yeah. grateful that you took the time to join me on the show. And I'm going to put everything in the show notes as far as where people can find you. And I have just one last question that I ask everybody who comes on the show. And it's a strange little question, but I find it comes with some profound answers. And the question is this, and you as a skydiver will have a particular opinion on this, I think. So here's the question. If you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Love yourself more. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Peter. I, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you being on the show, and I appreciate what you said. My pleasure. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm really grateful that you joined us. This has been a fabulous, albeit quick, conversation with Peter Shankman. Maybe we'll be able to get him back on the show again to talk even further about the ADHD brain and how you can use it to innovate and create and be creative. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg reminding you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. <music> 
Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset.